Good morning. Yeah. I'm Katao Damasi, uh, the Dean of the School of Public Health at uh, SUNY Down State. So I'm here to introduce uh, Dr. David Katz. It's uh, with a special excitement that I introduce him. Have you wondered how to prevent disease and avoid chronic diseases and live longer? Probably you'll get the answer from uh, Dr. David when he talks about prevention of uh, diseases. A proper introduction of Dr. David Kahn's will take me a very long time. I'm sure you're here not to listen to me, so I will try to make it very brief. He is a well-recognized uh, global expert in nutrition, weight management, and prevention of diseases. He is a founding director of Yale University's Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center, past president of the American College of Life style medicine and founder and president of the True Health Initiatives. Dr. Kaz is an exceptional and exemplary public health leader. Uh, he has served as a role model, a teacher, and a mentor for several medical students and also public health professionals throughout the United States and the world. His research has been influential in shaping public health policy particularly in preventive medicine and also uh, in nutrition. Dr. Kaz is the recipient of many, many awards for his contributions to public health. He has received many honorary de de degrees, doctorate degrees, and he holds several US patents. He has appeared widely on radio and television, and probably most of you have seen him uh, on Good Morning America uh, on ABC News. He's uh, widely recognized for his abilities as an orator. Dr. Kaz has been praised by peers as the poet laureate of health promotion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. David Kaz. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, the borough president took us to church. <laughs> I mean, really, Eric? Amen. <laughs> we'll start there. Pleasure to be here. You know, th there is a pleasant peril of these congregations going to the same church, and that is you wind up preaching to the congregation. Right, So there's a good chance we are already a friendly audience with regard to the fundamental truth, the incontrovertible truth about lifestyle as medicine that's hiding in plain sight. But then again, stuff is notoriously good at hiding in plain sight, like that pesky elephant in the room. It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to meet his mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a, help, snake. <laughs> the fourth, folks, we're gonna need some help here reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said e'en the blindest man, can tell what this resembles most, deny the fact who can, 
This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant, is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So oft in theologic wars the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about the elephant not one of them has seen. Now, my friends, I fear we're prone to much the same tendency in epidemiology, nutritional epidemiology in particular, and hence my mission here this morning at the Borough President's Church <laughs> is to point, point out the elephant in the room. Here's what's on the breakfast menu. So we have looked past elephant bits. We will visit the dark wood of modern epidemiology, talk about Archimedes' levers, um, have some choices to consider. Okay. Have recourse to a big spoon. Uh, uh. Okay, uh, consider the tip of the spear, um, listen to voices, come again to a fork in the road, and see about elephant bounds. Are there any questions at all about this perfectly clear agenda? <laughs> all right, I'd best clarify. So I started out with an elephant in the room, but of course the, the other metaphor is the forest through the trees. It's my contention that if ever we are to escape the dark wood of modern epidemiology, we must first see the forest through the trees. And I, I was speaking to my good friend, Dr. Osfeld, about the fact that the very best scientists do science. And science is intrinsically reductionistic. It's how we know about things like synapses and build the technologies that can view the brain to advance psychiatry and public health for that matter. We break things down into the smaller bits of smaller bits, but there is a risk in that. We can all honor the power of science. Everybody here who's using a smartphone, damn, those things are smart, right? I mean, we can beam our thought to any other individual on the planet instantaneously. It's almost magic. Science is practical magic. But the peril in it is the reductionism that can cause us to lose the forest for the trees. Everybody's a tree expert. We lose sight of the forest even as it burns down. We need to fix that. If we are to escape the dark wood of modern epidemiology, we will need to see the forest through the trees. And in this dark wood I speak of chronic diseases, so eloquently described to us already this morning, are taking years from people's lives. And because they're chronic diseases, they're not just doing that, they're not just killing us prematurely, they are also first taking life from people's years. And the idea that these chronic diseases are not the causes of premature death was revealed emphatically and decisively the year I completed my training in preventive medicine at Yale. I was trained in internal medicine. I decided taking care of people after they got sick wasn't enough. I wanted to be more involved in helping keep people healthy in the first place. Trained in preventive medicine, completed that program in 1993, and this paper came out. Actual causes of death in the United States. Bill Fagy and Mike McGinnis basically said in this seminal paper, the stuff that goes on death certificates written there by sleepy medical residents at three in the morning in the hospital about cause of death is all nonsense. It tells us nothing when someone dies of complications of a myocardial infarction to see that atherosclerotic heart disease was the cause of death. It's true, but entirely unilluminating. What caused that? So McGinnis and Figge were among the first and arguably the best to get their arms around this issue, wrestled under control and say, no, no, all of those things are effects, not causes. It's the stuff that causes that that matters, and that list is in our paper. And they enumerated a list of 10 factors that collectively accounted for virtually all of the premature deaths that occur in our country every year. And that list was fascinating. It was fascinating because those 26 years ago, everything on that list was already modifiable by knowledge in our hands and power. We had the latent potential to exercise, still mostly unrealized, by the way. 
And that list was fascinating because collectively it accounted for almost every premature death in the country but for a rounding error. The power of modifiable root causes of death is extraordinary. And that list was amazing because it was compiled of things we can change as individuals or we must come together to change. Sometimes the best and sometimes the only robust defense of the human body resides with the body politic. And when that's the case, we need to come together in a church like this one and get it done. But for my purposes, in terms of the trajectory of my career, the singularly remarkable thing about McGinnis and Figge's list is that 80% of the action was clustered in just the first three entries on the list of 10. And those three entries were in order in 1990, tobacco, poor diet, lack of physical activity, or as I have called them my entire career, bad use of feet, forks, and fingers. Bad use of feet, forks, and fingers by themselves accounted for 80% of the premature deaths in the US as of 1990. And the only problem with this epiphany is that the vintage is getting a bit old. I suspect you convened here for fresher data than 1993. I can see it in your eyes. OK, fair enough. Fresher data. 10 years later, Ali Magdad and colleagues at the CDC reanalyzed this issue, reaching substantially the same conclusion. All that had really changed in the span of a decade is that the gap between tobacco as the number one cause of premature death and the combination of bad use of feet and forks as number two had narrowed. It had narrowed for one good reason, less smoking, and one not so good reason, deteriorating use of our feet, degenerating use of our forks, worsening epidemics of obesity and diabetes to show for it. This then was the dark wood of modern epidemiology back in 2000, the paper was published in 2004, also now an old vintage, nearly 20 years old. Let's jump ahead, 2009, and while we're at it, let's flip this coin over, look at the other face. What if people get the behaviors right? Earl Ford and colleagues reported on survey research conducted among 23,000 adults living in and around Potsdam, Germany. They asked these 23,000 people about four factors related to their health. They asked, do you smoke, yes or no? Do you eat well, yes or no? And we must digress there because I, I can see you want a definition of eating well. And I understand you expect that definition to somehow factor in coconut oil. And I, I certainly know <laughs> that you expect it to reference both gluten and lectins, and obviously you expect it to account for whether or not a food's been genetically modified. I mean, duh. And clearly, you're interested in the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fat, right? And I think we should differentiate among the saturated fatty acids so that we carve out stearic and lauric acid from palmitic and myristic. You clearly are expecting all of right? Well, anyway, Ford and colleagues didn't do all of that. They defined eating well as habitual intake of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. And it was enough. It was enough, that simplistic definition of eating well. Well, hang on. Enough for what? I'll tell you in a minute. Back to our regularly scheduled program. So they said, do you smoke, yes or no? Do you eat well to find that simple-minded way, yes or no? Are you physically active on a regular basis, yes or no? And do you have a healthy weight, yes or no? And let's digress again for just a second because one of these things is not quite like the others. Arguably, one of these things just doesn't belong. Did anybody in the room wake up and decide what to weigh today? Would that it were so, right? Weight is not a decision. Weight is not a choice. Weight is not a behavior. Weight is an outcome. And as a physician taking care of patients for over 25 years, I can tell you it is a fact of metabolism that two people can eat the same, exercise the same, one gets fat, one stays thin. It's not fair, but unpleasant things can happen to thin people too. That's not always fair either. Life is just like that, right? And we know some of the reasons why this is the case, variations in genes, variations in resting energy expenditure, ethnic variations and other stuff we haven't figured out yet, but we know that it's true. And one of my concerns as we think about incentivizing healthy behavior is all too often BMI winds up on that list as if it were a behavior. It's not a behavior. You can choose whether or not to exercise. You can choose whether or not to eat well. You don't wake up and decide what to weigh today. 
Nobody does. Okay, end of digression two, back to long-suffering Dr. Ford's study. So they asked these 23,000 people, do you smoke, do you eat well, are you active, do you have a healthy weight? And they went on to compare the two ends of the spectrum. So they compared, I don't smoke, I eat well, I'm active, my weight's fine, to I smoke, eat badly, don't exercise, my weight's not so good. These people, over the entire multi-year span of the study, had an 80% lesser rate of all major chronic disease than these people. Flip the switch from bad to good on any one of these factors, and the probability of developing any major chronic disease goes down about 50%. But fire on all four cylinders, and as best we can tell, the lifetime probability of ever developing heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, the slings and arrows of modern epidemiologic misfortune is slashed, a stunning 80%. Now imagine if the news were to break tomorrow. You used to be able to say front page above the crease, but now it's on a glowing screen that we all like. So whatever website you prefer, there's a new drug available, FDA approved. It's available in bountiful supply. It is shockingly free of side effects, stunningly inexpensive, safe enough for children and octogenarians alike, and taken once daily for the rest of your life, will reduce your risk of ever getting any major chronic disease by 80%. Who would not want a prescription for that? The doctors wouldn't be able to keep up with the calls for prescriptions, except the doctors wouldn't be in their offices even to answer the phone. They'd be meeting with their broker trying to buy stock in the company selling the stuff. Because both taking that pill and owning the stock would be excellent ideas. But for the fact that there is no such pill. And in my professional opinion, there never will be any such pill. But lifestyle is exactly that medicine and we've known about it since 1993 at least, and arguably since the insights of Hippocrates. Anyway, if you happen not to like Potsdam for some particular reason, or you're really fussy and want your data fresher still, we have reaffirmation of these findings in 80% variance in the risk of all major chronic disease in a cohort study by Kavavik et al. a few years ago in the UK, more recently still by McCullough et al. here in the US, and by the way, I'll be happy to share slides so those of you who don't capture images of all the bibliography can get access to it. Otherwise, you can just email me. I'm happy to share. And, and I would argue that this is one of the more repetitive drumbeats in all of the peer-reviewed literature. Again and again. Oh, no, don't start that again. And again and again. We are reminded that a short list of lifestyle factors, effectively what we manage to do with our feet, our forks, and our fingers, could shift our medical destinies by a summative 80%. 80% less risk of all major chronic disease. And Eric, I'm, I'm routinely inclined to do exactly what you did and ask people to think about the people they love who are going through a chronic disease. And we can do this exercise. Who loves somebody who's been affected by heart disease? Show of hands. Who loves somebody who's been affected by diabetes? Show of hands. Who loves somebody affected by cancer? Show of hands. Who loves somebody affected by stroke? Show of hands. Who loves somebody affected by dementia? Show of hands. These scourges of modern epidemiology have invaded our homes. They have invaded our families. We speak in public health about statistics and epidemiology, and it can seem remote. But it's not. It's up close. It's intimate. It's personal. Imagine a world where eight times in 10, those questions did not result in people raising their hands. 80% of us who just put our hands up would not because those things don't happen. That world is possible. That world is within reach. If only we would grasp it. And the power of this has virtually no limits. It reverberates to our very pith and marrow, to within the double helix of DNA itself. We were giddy with the potential of genomics at the start of the genomic age, thinking that medical destiny resided there. In fact, it does not. DNA is not destiny, with very rare exceptions. Sickle cell disease, and actually some of the genetic work may fix that. Huntington's disease, rare exception. But to a largely neglected degree in our culture, dinner is destiny. 
and we have research to show that. So Dean Ornish, one of the leaders in lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition as medicine, did this study with colleagues some years ago. They enrolled 30 men with early stage prostate cancer. We heard about prostate cancer already this morning. In its early stages, we're not sure whether or not to treat prostate cancer because it may progress, it may not, and if it doesn't, the treatment could be worse than the disease. So we do watchful waiting. Doctors carefully monitor these patients to see if the disease progresses. They treat only if it does. But Dr. Ornish and colleagues say, well, we can do better than just watch and wait. While we're doing that, let's give these men the benefit of lifestyle as medicine. And so they did. They gave them optimal plant-based nutrition, routine physical activity, obviously no tobacco, and in addition, plenty of good sleep. They helped them mitigate their stress and they cultivated strong social interactions. And as the past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I argue that is the six-cylinder engine of lifestyle as medicine. So plant-based nutrition is the centerpiece, but we're talking about feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. The six-cylinder engine of lifestyle as medicine. So they were firing on all six cylinders in this study. And over a span of months, the researchers went on to study not so much the men with the cancer and not so much the cancer in the men, but preferentially the genes in the men with the cancer. And what they found is that this intervention took 500 cancer promoter genes and effectively turned them off, and 50 cancer suppressor genes shown here and radically turned them on. Left is before, right is after, red is off, green is on. The power of lifestyle is such that it can refashion our fate at the very level of our genes. You change your behaviors, it can change the behaviors of your genes. This is a power we're only beginning to realize, and this is a branch of the literature that's filling up fast. So again, we thought DNA was destiny. Mostly it's not. Mostly dinner is, and lunch, and breakfast. We even have evidence that lifestyle can alter the very architecture of our chromosomes. These green caps are telomeres. The length of our telomeres, the caps at the ends of chromosomes, arguably the single most potent predictor in all of biology of the length of healthy lifespan. Long telomeres, long healthy life. Now, other things being equal. Ill-advised, even with very long telomeres, to stand in front of moving buses and trains, for example. But other things being equal, long telomeres, long healthy life, and there is evidence, again, our friend Dr. Ornish, who turns up everywhere in the lifestyle medicine space, uh, but also Elizabeth Blackburn, a Nobel laureate in medicine, that lifestyle interventions can lengthen telomeres. So we're starting to understand the cellular mechanisms by which lifestyle medicine is the most potent medicine ever conceived. And we know Although we cannot alter the genetic hand we're dealt, we have massive control over how that hand is played. That's called epigenetics. And before I tell you about this study very briefly, I'd like to point out to all of you that to some extent your medical destiny was shaped in the womb of your maternal grandmother. We are all a mix of genes from mother and father. Our mother was a mix of genes from her mother and father. But the genes our mother gave us formed inside our mother they were imparted to us by her egg, which formed inside her ovary. And that egg inside our mother's ovary formed in the womb of our maternal grandmother. Infant girls are born with all the eggs they will ever have. The ovaries ultimately mature and deliver those eggs, but they're already there fully formed. The genes in those eggs are fully formed. And the environment of our maternal grandmother's womb exerts an influence on the epigenome in that egg. 95% of chromosomal real estate is not genes. 5% is genes, 95% is the epigenome. The levers and switches that turn genes on and off, up or down, those levers and switches were set in our mother, in her mother's womb, and imparted to us. What a profound responsibility. There really is transmission across a sweep of generations, not just to one. Lamarck, who argued that the blacksmith's muscles should be bestowed upon his children, was a little bit right after all. Mendel was more right, Darwin was more right, Lamarck was a little bit right. Actually, our behaviors are transmissible. They influence the epigenome and we transmit that too. But here's the good news. 
at any moment, including at age 79, we can take control of our epigenome and reset those levers and switches. And so this study, high-risk people for heart disease, bad genes, got a lifestyle intervention, and they outdid the bad genes, slashed their rates of cardiovascular events in half. Even if we're dealt a bad genetic hand, we can play it masterfully, we can still win the game. And winning the game doesn't mean lowering your cholesterol in six weeks. It doesn't mean losing 27 pounds in 22 minutes, no matter what they tell you in the infomercials. <laughs> winning the game means more years in life, more life in years, healthy people have more fun. That's winning the game. So I make the case, hope I have, that the master levers of medical destiny are not the tools of the medical trade, not the stethoscope we docs carry across our shoulders through the corridors of hospitals, nor anything at the cutting edge of technological advance, not PET or SPECT or fMRI. The master levers of medical destiny were in our hands all along. They're what we manage to do every day with our feet, our forks, and our fingers. And I trust you know what Archimedes said about a lever, give me one long enough I can move the whole world. Make no mistake, these levers are long enough and should long since have served to move the whole world of modern epidemiology and public health to a better place. But, alas, we like to say knowledge is power. Would that it were so. Knowledge is necessary for power. Knowledge is prerequisite for power. Knowledge is not commensurate with power until we use it. And the gap between what we know, indeed what we have long known, and what we do with what we know belies the wishful thinking that knowledge is power. And so a luminous opportunity to add years to lives and life to years has been squandered this quarter century and more. Not lost in translation, but lost in want of translation. The failure to take what we know and turn it into what we do routinely. And folks, it is a privilege to come to a place like Brooklyn where that will exists, to work together, to mobilize the body politic, to turn the promise of knowledge into power at last. It is long overdue, and we have been reaping the whirlwind. When knowledge isn't power, things do not improve. In fact, they tend to go south and so all these years since McGinnis and Figge's memo, we have been watching rising rates, not falling, of chronic disease, rising rates of obesity in the U.S. and around the world. This paper, The Global Burden of Disease Focused on the U.S., tells us that with the most recent data, the single leading cause of premature death in the United States is food. This thing that should sustain us this thing that should nourish and nurture us, the construction material for the growing bodies of children and grandchildren we love is killing us. It's really quite a travesty. And despite all we know about how to control weight by eating well and being active, rates of obesity just continue to rise. This is the latest color-coded map from the CDC with red representing a prevalence of obesity greater than 30 percent. They had to introduce this color just in the most recent map. Gives a whole new meaning to red state. <laughs> and not so good. And, and, and by the way, there is considerable overlap, but that's a topic. <laughs> I'll defer that one to the politicians. Moving on quickly. What is the problem? Why all these years has knowledge not been power? Well, I think arguably you could say if you take this, Homo sapiens in their native habitat, and you add this, the modern foodscape as it were, you pretty much inevitably get this. You've noticed, you noticed the pause. I've learned to anticipate two-beat appreciation for this slide, so I'll wait for that second beat before I move on. In much the same way as, we, as if we took this and added this, we would get this. And I give you my figurative trademark for more than 25 years, the polar bear in the Sahara. I, I note hastily that when my wife, who's sitting right here, and I put this slide together 25 years ago, 
there was no imminent threat of this actually happening to polar bears, and alas, that has changed. So our point was not climate change here. I'll come back to climate change before I'm done. Our point was adaptation. Polar bears are marvels of survival, but beautifully adapted to just one particular habitat, and that is a cold habitat. And the very traits and tendencies that foster their survival in the cold would conspire against them, as indeed they're doing, uh, as things warm up. You retain warmth where it's scarce, it keeps you alive. You do the same beneath the burning Sahara sun in summer, and it cooks your goose. And my point in this slide is that we are polar bears in the Sahara. Throughout most of human history, calories were relatively scarce and hard to get, and physical activity was unavoidable. It did not require gym membership or specialized footwear. It was called survival, and everybody just did it every day. We have devised a modern world where physical activity is scarce and hard to get, and calories are unavoidable. Houston, we have a problem, and Brooklyn, and every place in between. I submit to you that as a species, we have no native defenses against caloric excess or the lore of the couch, never having needed them before. No native defenses, that is, save one. Great big homo sapien brains. We are, arguably, smarter than the average bear and can think our way out of this mess of our own devising, and that's just what we need to do. As we begin that job, I think we find that immediately the problem fractures into two component problems. The first is, it may seem such a mess this land of golden arches, where multicolored marshmallows masquerade as part of a complete breakfast. It may seem you just can't get there from here. I would argue we can, one step at a time, one sandbag in a levee to control the rising tides of toxic tribulation at a time. We can get there from here. And in some other talk at some other time, I'll talk to you about all those steps. But for now, I want to spend time on the other component problem, and that is we will never get there from here if we don't know where there is. Now, again, I realize this congregation knows where there is. That's why you're here. You're here because you know where there is. I got that, okay? But we must all go out and preach the gospel, and we must preach the gospel predicated on both our native sense and the relevant science because we must be persuasive. We must win converts. We will never get there from here. If we can't agree, we know where there is. Now, with regard to fingers, not much argument. Smoking is bad, not smoking is better. Any dissent? See how easy that is? With regard to feet, generally little dissent there too. Using them good, staying on our rear ends all day long, not so much for the most part. Movement is good. Any disagreement? But when we come to forks, ah, there's the rub. Because even in this audience, if I went around the room, there'd be different theories about things like the importance of gluten or lectins or which vegetables are better than which others and how much fructose actually matters and all of that. Even here, even in our congregation, there would be dissent. And out there in the world, damn, it's so much worse. Basically, the public says, well, hey, we don't know anything. Because you know what I heard on the Today Show that somebody just came along and threw all you guys under the bus. And everything we thought we knew up until yesterday is wrong. Again, until tomorrow, when somebody comes to throw this guy under the bus, and around and around we go, getting nowhere, acting as if we don't know where there is, and leading most people to ask this time-honored question, <laughs> what to trust about food? <laughs> What'd y'all think? and bringing us to a fork in the road. Along one time, we remain forever befuddled about the basic care and feeding of Homo sapiens, and I'd like to propose the alternative road. I've devoted my career to this, I won't belabor it, but books, including my most recent textbooks, articles, making the case that the truth is hiding in plain sight. I'm in the excellent company of people like Darius Mozafarian, Dean of the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts, Jim Mann at the University of Auckland, Frank Hugh, who chairs Nutrition at Harvard, and many, many others. If you look without bias at arguments for or against low-fat diets and vegan diets and low-glycemic diets and the DASH diet and the Diabetes Prevention Program and paleo and low-carb and Mediterranean, our culture runs on the dialogue that one of these is better than the others today. Wait until tomorrow. My diet can beat your diet. 
and we bicker and make no progress. And the reality is the olive in the middle, nicely skewered by Michael Pollan when he said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And although that leaves quite a bit to the imagination, in the generalities, it is fundamentally correct. Real, wholesome food, plant predominant. Plant exclusive, fine. Not necessary for everybody, but let's just get everybody moving in the right direction. Let's not make perfect the enemy of good. And frankly, much the same conclusion in the 572 pages of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report. Yes, it's true. Pithy Michael Pollan got it down to seven words. This was 572 pages. But no offense, borough president, this is government work. What are you going to do, right? <laughs> We actually reached much the same conclusion in 2015 when Old Ways sponsored a common ground conference. I was privileged to co-chair with Walter Willett in Boston. We convened disagreeing nutrition experts from all around the world, Mediterranean, paleo, vegan, and over a few days we mapped out the common ground and decided we agree about 80 to 90 percent of everything. It's just that when you get, put a microphone in front of us, all we ever talk about is our disagreements. I'm right, they're wrong. Listen to me now. We got to stop doing that. Right? We mostly agree. And I knew that because I'd had lunch with these characters and I said, hey, everybody's eating most of the same stuff. That matters. Let's tell people. Oh, and by the way, this idea that we've got to pick one scapegoat, right? So, you know, sugar's bad now, so saturated fat must be good. Nonsense. No, sorry folks, uh, are there Mark Hyman fans in the audience? Apologies, but Dr. Hyman did not singularly discover the harms of sugar in his garage last Wednesday. We've actually known for 40 years that excess sugar is harmful. There have only been dietary guidelines in the U.S. since 1980. These were those, 1980, seven bullets, number five, avoid too much sugar. Uh, we've been delivering the memo for decades, it's just that nobody is bothering to read it. They're too busy eating multicolored marshmallows as part of their complete breakfast or something. Oh, and by the way, this whole pop culture narrative, this might be Gary Taubes. Uh, you know, we cut fat and got fatter and sicker, so we picked the wrong macronutrient, we need to cut carbs now. Uh, also, nonsense, uh, for many, many reasons. One of which is everything from lentils to lollipops is carbohydrate. How can you pass summary judgment on that vast expanse of the foodscape? But we never cut fat in the first place. Uh, you know, there are two ways to cut fat as a percent of calories. There is the sensible way that might actually help people, and there's the American way. Uh, you know. So, you know, in the sensible way, you would actually eat a bit less fatty food. Uh, in America, we don't like less. Less is bad, it's a bad concept. More, we like more. So uh, we, we went that way. And if you want to reduce the percent of calories you get from fat, all you need to do is keep eating the same amount of fat and eat a lot more of everything else. <laughs> do the math. You grow the denominator, right? You guys, math is that good, right? You can either shrink the numerator, grow the denominator. We grew the denominator. These are data for dietary intake trends for the past 40 years or so. Total intake of fat actually went up but total intake of refined carbohydrate added sugar went up more. So calories went up more than fat. Fat as a percent of calories went down. But folks, here's what it tells us. We were eating more of everything, and then we carry on as if the ongoing obesity epidemic is some mystery that requires more biochemical and epigenetic insights. Uh, hello? We're eating more of everything. And we eat, oh, th this is great. This is a flow diagram. Just Google America diet changes Vox. Uh, not necessarily right now. I'd rather you pay attention to me. But <laughs> at some point, when you're not paying attention to me, Google America diet changes Vox. You'll pull up this flow diagram. It'll show you the shifts in food intake over the past 40 years in the U.S. It's very illuminating. But what I was going to say is we even know why. Michael Moss, author of Salt, Sugar, Fat, wrote this New York Times Magazine cover story, The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. He's not the first to give us this news, but he's a Pulitzer Prize winner and he does it beautifully. What he tells us is that every major food company in the U.S. and around the world hires teams of PhDs, gives them those functional MRI machines we use to look at brains, and marching orders to design food we can't stop eating. Unfortunately, synaptic connections can be exploited. And big food is in the business of doing just that. These guys are instructed to design food people cannot stop eating until their arm gets tired from lifting it to their mouths. <laughs> and again, then we, the docs, give our patients advice about portion control and send them out into this world. And this is why I would argue we need 
enlightened leaders like the borough president here, people who say we've got to work together on this. This is an unfair challenge for the individual. So we know why we've been eating more. As we reflect on solutions, some people would argue this is the elephant in the room. We need to think about the Stone Age. We need to think about our Paleolithic origins. Mostly the paleo diet argument has become an excuse to eat pastrami and bacon. And folks, I've got news for you, there was no Paleolithic pastrami, <laughs> right? I never see it used as an excuse to walk 12 miles every day and eat 100 grams of fiber, which by the way, the, exp the true experts in paleo tell us we ate 100 grams of fiber. My guess is that the paleo people doing all the opining in the blogosphere wouldn't have time to do all the opining in the blogosphere if they ate 100 grams of fiber in the day because they'd be in the bathroom. <laughs> so they're not interested in that. Back to the pastrami. But there is utility in thinking about the Stone Age. We are creatures like all others, like that polar bear of mine. We are adapted to a native habitat. So what the Stone Age teaches us is that we are constitutional omnivores. Adaptationally, physiologically, metabolically, we are omnivorous. We can thrive eating plants or animals. Now our Stone Age ancestors hunted and ate wild animals who in turn ate wild plants. We clearly are adapted to digest meat. Other animals aren't. I have a horse. My horse cannot eat meat. There are animals that must. Lions are obligate carnivores. We're in between. We have choices. This discussion, my friends, is about good choices. Being good people to one another, to the world, to our communities, to our own bodies who make good choices. So we have choices for dietary fat. What do we know? This study out of Harvard shows the higher the percent of total calories from saturated fat from the usual sources, meat, processed meat, dairy, processed dairy, the higher the rate of premature death from all causes. The higher the percentage of fat from unsaturated sources, mostly nuts, seeds, olives, avocados, fish and seafood, the lower the rate of premature death from all causes. That's pretty stark. This is in over 100,000 people followed for 30 years. And yet we wind up here again and again with the argument that saturated fat is good for us now, butter is back. Is it really? No, it is not. I, I won't spend the time to belabor this issue. You can ask me about it in the Q&A if you want more. But basically the two meta-analyses that are the foundation for the argument that saturated fat is good for us now showed that across a relatively high and relatively narrow range of saturated fat intake, rates of heart disease were high and constant. Therefore, saturated fat is good for us now. Uh, no, no, not so fast. It implied something to me. Maybe there's more than one way to eat badly and Americans are committed to exploring them all. And in fact, <laughs> that's exactly what's going on. When we cut saturated fat in this culture, we're not loading up on broccoli and lentils for crying out loud. We ate low fat junk food like snack well cookies. So thank goodness Lee and colleagues at Harvard came along and said, let's look at this. What happens when people cut saturated fat? Well, if they cut those calories and replace them with snack wells, sugar and refined carbohydrate, lateral move. Two ways of eating badly, two ways of having lots of heart disease. If they replace saturated fat with trans fat calories, they stop eating butter, start eating stick margarine, things go from bad to worse, frying pan to fire. But if they replace saturated fat calories with whole grain calories, massive reduction in heart disease risk. And if they replace saturated fat calories with unsaturated fat calories from nuts and seeds, olives, avocado, massive reduction in heart disease risk. No, saturated fat is not good for us now. And no, all carbohydrate is not created equal. But we all know that, right? Lentils to lollipops, pinto beans to jelly beans. Summary judgment about carbs is just so much pop culture nonsense. It's got to stop. We need to be talking about foods, as I suspect all of us do, not macronutrients. It's just not helpful. We have choices for protein. Again, 100,000 people, 30 years. The higher the intake of protein from animal sources, the higher the rate of premature death from all causes. The higher the percent of protein calories from plant sources, beans and lentils in particular, the lower the rate of premature death from all causes. And here we see that in a somewhat more granular fashion. Just scan down the list, bottom line. Biggest reduction, this is women, heart disease, biggest reduction substituting beans for beef. And by the way, in the past year, a study out of, well, a little more than a year ago now, Loma Linda suggested that if the average American would routinely eat beans in the place of beef, just that, 
we could achieve roughly 60 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions pledged in the Paris Accord. Yes, we need responsible government action, but sometimes, my friends, the power is right in our hands and in our kitchens. We can take action ourselves. We have choices for preserving our aquifers. We heard a lot about this during the peak of California's drought. Off the charts in terms of water utilization is beef. A thirsty world must consume less beef, period, end of story. And so I'm making the case as we think about the power of plant-based nutrition for health that we also must project beyond the limits of our own skin and think about this world we're in. In fact, let me pause here now. I'm in a school of public health. I'm honored to be here today. I don't know if you need my invitation or not, my fellow health professionals, but on the chance you do, let me issue it. You cannot call yourself a health professional in 2019 if you are not advocating forcefully, emphatically, and every chance you get for the health of the planet. There are... There is no public health left to protect on a ravaged planet. It is our patient too, okay? So we need to protect our aquifers. We have choices for the climate. Again, massive reduction in greenhouse gas emissions possible with a shift to plant-based eating. I love this piece in the conversation, a couple years old now, but still good. Meat may or may not be a complex health issue. Most of us think it's not, but they said it was. Okay, fine, but it's a simple environmental one. The world needs to eat less of it. We have choices for the economy. This was just out, group at Tufts, including Darius Mosafarian, cost effectiveness of financial incentives, encouraging people to eat more plants, massive reductions in the expenditures through Medicaid and Medicare. We scientists need to do the work that empowers enlightened leaders, like the borough president here, so they can make the economic argument for investing in plant-based nutrition and lifestyle transformation. It's not just good for people and good for the planet, it's good business too. Everybody can win here. And there was a bigger analysis a few years ago out of Oxford showing savings to the tune of many trillions of dollars over a time horizon of a decade and longer if we were to shift the world's dietary patterns to more plant-based eating. We have choices for biodiversity. We are ruining fragile ecosystems, cutting down rainforests to grow palm plantations for palm oil in Borneo cutting them down to graze cattle in the Amazon. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the person whose processed snack is the reason the last orangutan no longer has a tree to climb. These are the things we're doing. These are the implications of our dietary choices. And we have the choice of a grand confluence, eating better for the sake of ourselves and the planet. It's all one thing. And this was beautifully encapsulated in the recently announced Eat Lancet Commission. That was their conclusion. The same fundamentals of a healthy diet for people are good for the planet and vice versa. And yet, we do find ourselves mired here. This is the typical American diet from the book Hungry Planet, What the World Eats. And so the question in these last few minutes as we sprint to the finish line is, okay, fine. Whoops. Lifestyle is the best of all possible medicine with plant-based nutrition as the centerpiece. How on earth do we at last get the medicine to go down? Lord knows the last thing we need is more spoons full of sugar. But we need some kind of spoon to get this dang medicine to go down. It can't look like this, and this is the status quo. I told you about the work of Michael Moss. The good guys are bailing a sinking ship with pipettes. The bad guys are flooding it with a fire hose. And folks, how many of you are parents? Grandparents, aunts or uncles, know a kid. <laughs> just, I'd like us all to be in on this. I want to ask you another question. So health professionals advocate for the planet. It is your duty. Here's another one. Be outraged. Where is the outrage? When we hear, when we hear in a New York Times Magazine cover story that our food supply is willfully manipulated to make people fat and diabetic for the profit of big companies, where the hell is the massive outrage among loving parents and grandparents? Because when lovingparentsandgrandparents.org becomes a special interest group, I pity the fool that gets in our way, right? We could be the greatest special interest group the world has ever known. But it is time, past time, 
for outrage. We know how important it is to eat well. We have rigged the food supply, making it damn near impossible to do. I don't see nearly enough outrage. Righteous indignation, my friend. So I invite you to advocate for the planet, and I invite you to be outraged. Join me. I'm outraged all the time. And I mean all this very literally. Th these were the new kid cereals introduced in 2017. We're wringing our hands about epidemic type 2 diabetes in kids, and corporate America is responding with sprinkled donut crunch. Be outraged. It's time. The solution we need looks less like the status quo, more like this. We got to the moon for three reasons, so far as I know. We wanted to go. We're an ingenious and relentless species, and we all agreed where to find the damn thing. I think we want to go to a world where there's 80% less chronic disease. We're still ingenious and relentless. I think agreeing on where there is is a crucial missing piece of this puzzle. And I think it's also time to recognize we're asking too much of individuals. The big spoon is culture. Lifestyle is the medicine. Culture is the spoon. Yes, doctors can issue prescriptions, but we really need neighborhoods and communities and a culture that fosters healthy living as the norm. And we have evidence of culture as the big spoon in the world's blue zones, where people routinely live to be 100 and don't get chronic disease. They eat well, they're active, they tend not to smoke, they sleep enough, they're not stressed out, and they have a strong sense of community in these five sites around the world. But it's because it's normal. It's not because individuals are overcoming the currents of their culture, it's because the currents of their cultures in Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Loma Linda, California, Okinawa, Japan, and the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica flow towards health, not away. And we see the same thing in the Bolivian Amazon where the Chamani have the cleanest coronary arteries known to science, and we even do know, borough president, that blue zones can be converted to blueprints and transplanted. North Karelia, Finland had the highest rates of premature heart disease and death from it in the world in the middle of the 20th century. They learned the lesson, lessons of the seven country study. They reformed diet and lifestyle. They reduced heart disease rates by over 82%. They added 10 years to average life expectancy. One of the most stunning achievements in the history of modern public health. We could do this. We should do this. We've been waiting too long. So, lifestyle's the medicine, culture is the spoon, but yes, we healthcare professionals want to be at the tip of the spoon, or spear, and leading the effort, and I think there are new ways to do that, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the end here momentarily, but I'd like to point out one contribution in this space. Let's acknowledge that we tend only ever to manage what we measure. We should measure what matters. And frankly, diet matters most. So blood pressure is important to health. Imagine all this talk about blood pressure and never measuring it. Well, of course we measure it. And we know that glucose is really important to health for people with impaired glucose metabolism, and it would be silly not to measure that and track it. And fitness is important to people's health. So, of course, we are very interested these days in measuring fitness. But the single most important variable in the health equation in the modern world is diet and we just about never measure it. How many of you have completed a food frequency questionnaire or a seven-day food diary? Small minority in an audience of people attending a nutrition conference. In the world outside, it's virtually nobody, and with good reason, right? These damn things make your eyeballs catch fire, don't they? I mean, I mean, if we got up close to those of you who just raised your hand, we would see that your eyelashes are singed, right? I mean, you know, it just goes on and on. It's tedious. And, well, we need to fix that. We need to take a page from Matt Damon, you all see the Martian? He's stranded alone, spoiler alert, he's stranded alone on Mars. He's an engineer, he's up there stuck and he's talking to his video diary and he says, so I can come to the conclusion that, and you expect him to say, I'm gonna die cold and alone up here. But he, instead he says, and forgive me, I quote, I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. And well, frankly, you know, to some extent, our excesses in engineering got us into this messed up modern world. We need the same kind of ingenuity to get us out. And we certainly ought to be able to measure what matters in 2019. I've launched a startup company called Diet ID to reinvent dietary assessment, tracking, and coaching to help in that enterprise. And so we borrowed from a Feropter, this device you use when you go to the eye doctor. They ask you which image is clear, which is blurry. You've all played this game. 
and you pick and you pick and you pick again and 30 seconds later they don't guess at your prescription they've got an exact match for your eyes we do that with diet we have a fully realized library of dietary prototypes we say which of these looks like you after we know a little bit about you we say pick and pick and pick again and within 30 seconds we know your diet type down to the specific levels of nutrients and the 20 15 HEI score, so objective measures of diet quality. We help people find a goal diet. We help navigate them from here to there. I'm not selling this to you. It's a B2B. I'm just making you aware these kinds of innovations are possible, should happen, and we can change the world. But the single most important thing to do is to rally around these fundamental truths hiding in plain sight. And I'd like to ask you to join this congregation, too. I founded the True Health Initiative. It's a federally authorized 501c3 to bring together the fractious voices in lifestyle nutrition to tell the world what most of the experts already know but the public doesn't. And that is, across the divide, from vegan to paleo, we agree more than we disagree. You do go to a conference with actual experts. The vegans have a plate full of greens and lentils or beans for protein. The paleo experts have the same greens and maybe wild salmon or maybe bison but their plates look more like one another than either looks like the typical glow-in-the-dark American food plate, and the public deserves to know that too. So the True Health Initiative is predicated on the work of an illustrious colleague. He wrote a case report about a pachyderm with extraordinary auditory acuity or uncompensated schizophrenia. We've never really known which, but Horton could hear who's that nobody else could hear until the who's all came together and said, we are here. In the case of the True Health Initiative, we have 500 world-leading experts from over 40 countries coming together not to say we are here, but to say we agree. Because I think it's time to generate a signal that can be heard above the noise. And if you agree, please check out truehealthinitiative.org, add your voice, join the chorus. In unity, there is strength. Uh, and uh, my latest book, The Truth About Food, which covers all these things I'm talking about, is written in the service of the True Health Initiative. All proceeds from the book go to support the True Health Initiative, so you may want to check that out as well. Truth About Food, Why Pandas Eat Bamboo and People Get Bamboozled. And that brings us to the final fork in the road for far too long. We have let health languish in our culture along the road less traveled. For far too long, we have let squander a luminous opportunity in want of translation. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you here this morning in Brooklyn because we must come together to generate the strength born of unity, to take at last the road less traveled, add years to lives, add life to years, save the planet, and when we do all of that, the elephant in the room still won't be able to fly, but will look like this. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and now we have some time for some, to take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Can we please have the last slide that had his um, email? Yes. It just flashed on and it went off in two seconds, please. I, I'm, I'm too easy to find, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So david.katz at yale.edu. <laughs> and, and by the way, let me warn you in advance. Um, you'll get an auto response that says something along the lines of, I can't answer every email. I'll probably answer you. <laughs> I try. I really do try. Good morning. Thank you so much for the great presentation. So you spoke on it a little bit about our argument and, you know, we need to kind of get together, but novel and new and arguing is fun to look at. So it's something that we continue to get... Um, that's a problem. So I just wonder how you can speak to that because no, I think that's, you know, it keeps it interesting for people and that's why it is sustained for the public. Yeah, no, it, it's an extremely important point. So I, I worked for two and a half years on air for Good Morning America and it, it's a poorly kept secret in broadcast media that the mantra in the control room is comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable. So, you know, it, it is not the purpose of Good Morning America or the Today Show or People Magazine to educate you. 
It is their purpose to titillate you. And in fact, the more often they can refute today what they told you yesterday so you buy another copy and tune in tomorrow, the better. So on the one hand, this does require ongoing efforts between the health professions and the media. We need to offer to train them in understanding how science works. No, you really shouldn't make a whole lot of noise about every study as if it refutes everything we knew up until yesterday. Science is incremental. You should remind people, this adds to what we knew. Here's someone to tell us what they think it means in context. Invite those experts. Make sure you land in a sensible place. Make sure even if you titillate and tease at the beginning of the piece, you end with something that makes sense of it. So there, there is a need for us to collaborate. On the other hand, ultimately, you could, you could pose exactly this question you're posing about media, about the food supply, right? We could say, you know, people like salty food and they like sweet food and they like fatty food and they're giving us what we want. Well, that's true, but there are two issues in play. First, they help to create what we want. So we have a culture where we've created this desire for titillation in our news rather than news in our news we could decide it's time to change our tastes. A movement begins with a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens, right? Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world, indeed nothing else ever has, with the possible exception of large asteroids. But um, we could change our taste for media, right? And we could say, no, you know, actually, we're gonna start tuning out the stuff that gives us titillation and overhypes things and looking for media that deliver well-considered information. This study doesn't change everything. Here's how to interpret in context. The other thing to note is that maybe diet needs to come off that list. I've been one of the judges for US News and World Report for the annual best diet context for the past decade. And I play, but every year I also tell the editors there, you do realize those places around the world where people actually eat well, they are not waiting for news about the best diet every year. They eat the way their parents ate, who ate the way their parents ate. The Blue Zones, they've been eating the same way for generations. Diet does not need to be news every day. And then my final component to your answer is, okay, if we still want diet to be news because there's such fascination, let's have the news be how rather than what. So we all know now what is a healthy diet. It's incontrovertible, it's incontestable, everybody agrees. How do you get there from here? Today, we have another expert on to talk about culinary tips and culinary medicine and what's happening in medical schools and how you can engage children and what should be happening in secondary school and on and on, the how. Let's have endless stories about the how, really cool stories about the how, and let's hear from individuals who've used the power of diet and lifestyle to transform life, you know, uh, the borough president's story, I mean, that, that's, that's great media right there, right? I mean, that was fantastic. Well, you know, there are a lot of people like him out there who can tell their story. So here's what it can do for you, and now let's talk about how, right? Let's shift the narrative. We do not have to listen to nonsense just because there's nonsense to be heard. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you. That was beyond fabulous. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Rich Rosenfeld, and the question I have for you is this. You alluded to the congregation who's here, and it's sort of like when you send out uh, satisfaction surveys in a medical office and you get a note back saying, why is it that the only offices that send these out are the ones who don't need to, you know? Um, it, it's sort of fish discover water last, and we have a conference here. We're blessed we have close to 250 people coming. If you look at the registration, uh, we have 30, 40 medical students, which is great. Yes, it uh, is. Lots of folks from the community. And last time I checked, there were three resident physicians. We have, I think, 20 residency training programs at Downstate with about 800 residents. And this has been promoted, 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 and three and one from my department, maybe four, have found a way to come today. Um, I promoted it to the chairs of medicine, to family practice, to others. Some of them are here, but very few practicing physicians who can't take time off from their busy day to come hear talks like this. So how do we crack that nut? It's great that we're all here, and the choir's here, and the congregation's here, but how do we get it to the mainstream, the well, people for, that really need to absorb the message? Yeah. So first of all, thank you again uh, for 
convening us. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent question. I, I'd like to speak up in defense of those medical residents, which I, I probably don't need to do uh, because the docs in the room are all on their side. So we've all been there. You know, I mean, those guys are working 100 hours a week. If, if they can spend a few minutes napping, uh, they should probably spend a few minutes napping, right? So, I mean, it, you know, we, we have to fit this in where it works best. So a, a, a few answers. And, and I realize the question is both real and rhetorical. You're just sort of throwing it out there. This is our problem. We wind up getting together with members of our own congregation. We preach a gospel. We share. We all say amen. But have we converted anybody? Have we changed the world? So first, this must be culture-wide. We need to acknowledge that the burden cannot be preferentially on healthcare professionals. We cannot live in a culture where big food profits massively by making people fat and sick and expect doctors in moments of clinical counseling or other health professionals to fix it. In the blue zones, where people routinely live to be 100, where food is medicine, where they don't get chronic disease, and where at the age of 102 they go gentle into that good night because they go to sleep one night and just don't wake up the next morning, they never go to the ICU. In the blue zones, you ask them how they got there, nobody says, my doctor gave me great counseling. They don't even know how they got there. They just floated in the currents of their culture their whole lives, right? So it must be culture-wide. The education should begin in preschool in Head Start. We should be serving good food there and talking about it. The education must extend into kindergarten. We developed years ago at the Prevention Center a program called Nutrition Detectives. It was for elementary school kids. It taught them how to differentiate good from bad food, essentially, to make it simple. Using a food label, we taught them five clues that fit on a refrigerator magnet. We did a randomized trial in 1,200 families. The kids who got this 90-minute program, 90 minutes out of a whole school year, and we gave it away for free, by the way, um, kids who got the program, massive improvement in their food label literacy and their attitude. They, you know, instead of pulling on mom's elbow and saying, I want the one with SpongeBob on the cover, they would pull mom's elbow and say, no, this has partially hydrogenated oil, put it back. <laughs> I mean, really quite, but what we found in this randomized trial published in the Journal of School Health, by the way, is that the kids were effective vectors. We never talked to their parents. We just infected their offspring with the knowledge, but the kids took it home and infected their parents. We did before and after testing in the parents of the kids who either got the program or didn't. The parents of the kids who got nutrition detectives had a massive improvement in their food label literacy. So kids are powerful agents of change. We need to do this in kindergarten, elementary school. Then we need peer-to-peer -peer educational programs in old, for older kids. Uh, Health Corps, Mehmet Oz's program in high schools teaches good nutrition using peer mentors. We need more programs in colleges. There's a real great movement. Ken Tug at UMass is in the vanguard of this. Basically, culinary directors at colleges and universities who say, we've got a captive audience. We've got young people who aren't yet parents but are going to be that are getting all their meals from us. We can both feed them great stuff and teach them why it's great stuff while we've got them. And when they leave here, they'll have a whole host of new synaptic connections. They will have reprogrammed their thinking about nutrition. Huge opportunity. And then at the level of those of us who are already out in the world, well, yeah, I mean, clearly we need transformation of health professional education, too. That's happening. I'm really excited about culinary medicine, David Eisenberg, the work of many others, Tim Harlan at Tulane. But these programs that say, no, you can't teach doctors nutritional biochemistry and expect them to be able to counsel patients. You need to teach them good recipes they can make and eat. And then they can take that kind of information and pay it forward. That needs to happen, too. But ultimately, I think what we need to say is we're all in this together, we all care, and it really does become a force for cultural change. And I, I do think one of the key impediments, one of the reasons we're not seeing more and more programming with good information is because there's so much debate about what constitutes good information. And that is factitious debate. That is distraction, that is diversion, that is squandered resources. And so I, I submit to you as one of the potential remedies there, the True Health Initiative. We need an organization that can pull us together. One of the things I wanted to do there was make sure everybody's hero was represented. So on the Council of Directors, we have three former Surgeons General of the United States. We have household names like Sanjay Gupta. We have famous chefs like Alice Waters. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, we have the world's leading vegan experts, so everybody who's been mentioned here this morning, Gregor and Esselstyn and Ornish and all the others, but on the same panel, 
willing to say in public, we agree with those guys, are the world's leading experts on the paleo diet. Lauren Cordain, Mel Connor, Boyd Eaton, standing arm in arm with their vegan colleagues saying we agree more than we disagree. I think that's a potential game changer. We're working to reach three audiences through the True Health Initiative. Health professionals, the media, as I agree with you, crucial, right? So, you know, instead of all of these he said this, she said that pieces, we're looking to the day when at the end of that article or at the end of that piece they say, so we asked the True Health Initiative, a global aggregation of world's leading experts from many different perspectives and disciplines, and they had this fundamental truth to share, right? I'd like to get us there and the general public, because the general public obviously constitutes the source of political will to make all these other things happen. So uh, a, a long answer to a good rhetorical question. Thank you. <laughs> so so I, I just imagine people kind of thinking, all right, this guy probably thinks he's smart. I'm going to ask a question I know he can't answer. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question I know nobody could answer. Make him look like a giant doofus. And then, then, and then he can say thank you and goodbye. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's the 64 million, billion, trillion dollar question. And, and the answer is there are many, many answers. So, you know, if we want to teach people to cook, we need to make it fun and engaging. And frankly, we have all sorts of ways to do that now. It's a digital world. One of the great barriers in our work over the years at the Prevention Center has been reaching people, getting them together, you know, being where they are. But you know, now where people are is Facebook and Instagram, and there are whole new ways to reach people with information and, and fit it into their digital lives. Recipes, vignettes, videos, they're, they're wonderful tools. Uh, not to be self-promoting, but my wife, who's a brilliant cook, uh, grew up in southern France. Um, Basically, at one point, one of our kids coaxed her into turning all of the Katz family greatest hits into a free recipe site, Quizinicity.com. Everything we eat at home, Quizinicity.com, like Cuisine City, but with an I in the middle, Quizinicity.com. We just paid it all forward, and Catherine's done a magnificent job of not just posting all these great recipes, but filming herself, making them in the kitchen, showing you, here's how you do it. It's simple, it's fun, it's engaging. Some of them are oriented toward kids. So it's a great resource. There are others like it, but Quizinicity.com. These culinary medicine programs are teaching people how to cook at mid-career. It's a CME program. Basically, doctors can get continuing medical education credit learning how to cook great recipes. I could go on and on. There are many components. The cost issue. First, diabetes is expensive. Obesity is expensive and a ruined planet is really expensive, so we are not looking at the real cost of eating well versus eating badly, either for individuals, so there are people who will claim I can't afford fruits and vegetables, but I can't afford the copay to my endocrinologist for the rest of my life, they're wrong, right? So you know, we need a reality check there. We also need a correction in the farm bill, which ought to be a food bill, so we're subsidizing the right foods. There are also creative engineered solutions for people who can afford better food, but maybe are too busy to take the time to cook. We can send curated meal kits to their homes. There are more and more interesting opportunities in that space. And there's even really exciting stuff going on in the world of cookery. Uh, Brava is a smart oven. You can uh, check out Brava. Just Google Brava ovens. You can upload recipes from, now again, not everybody can afford this, but here's my fantasy. Third-party payers would pay to put this oven in the home of somebody for whom food should be medicine, but who can't afford it because it's less expensive than all those trips to the endocrinologist. This oven will accept uploads from your smartphone. You put all the foods for a recipe on a single tray, press one button, it will cook multiple foods at different temperatures in half the time simultaneously. So we can look to technological advances and we can look to connect the dots so that third party payers say, yes, food is medicine. We will start thinking about using the equipment that can get people there from here. 
the way we use medical equipment now, right? So no one short, discrete, simple answer to your question, but if we committed to it, could we crack this nut? Hell yeah, we could. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.